Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hi, we're back again. In uh, this lecture, we're going to uh, uh, focus on an in-depth discussion of the solutions of Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to remind you the equation that we wrote down at the end of last lecture. It's a rather formidable looking uh, differential equation that I've listed in this slide. Uh, the interaction potential energy is this 1 over R electrostatic Coulomb potential energy. Um, and um, that has to be, the, this, this form of this U of R, of course, has to be put into Schrodinger's equation. And uh, what we're trying to do is uh, find wave function psi that solve that, that equation. Now, there's a few things that, that you should recognize from this equation just based on our previous discussions. One is time does not appear in that equation, so it's the time-independent Schrodinger equation. The second thing is the, the, the reason you know we're talking about electrons is we put in the uh, mass of the electron, and that's subscripted with a small e. The reason we do that is we're going to have another quantum number called small m, and in order to distinguish between the mass of the particle and uh, the quantum number m, uh, we, we have to designate uh, the mass in terms of uh, m sub e. Um, because the equation is time independent, the solution psi are referred to as stationary quantum states of the system. And uh, there may be many possible solutions for this differential equation. In fact, there will be. Each solution um, corresponds to a different energy e. And uh, that gives the quantized uh, energy levels in this diagram. Um, the amazing thing to me about this is that uh, the exact analytical solutions to this differential equation are now well known. And so you can, uh, you can solve this problem analytically, um, which, uh, you know, just looking at, the, at the, um, the terms in that differential equation, you might think... Uh, is a very difficult task to achieve, but it, it, is, it is possible and we'll go through that. Um, throughout this, this lecture and the next uh, two lectures, right, it's important for you not to let the math get in the way of understanding. Uh, the math is formidable and uh, it's detailed. And if you really want to understand what's going on, you've got to make an effort to work through the math. But uh, you shouldn't get, uh, you shouldn't uh, throw away your understanding of quantum mechanics and uh, your intuition about what the possible solutions should look like. So what I, um, what I challenge you to do is I challenge you before we begin this discussion to uh, sketch out the uh, various solutions of this problem qualitatively. Um, I think you might be able to make a sketch uh, that would focus uh, specifically on the R coordinate. Uh, you should be able to sketch the potential energy that the electron experiences as a function of radial distance from the uh, nucleus. You should be able to put energy levels in that diagram qualitatively. You should be able to identify the classical turning points uh, on that diagram. And uh, you should be able to sketch in wave functions that roughly have the right behavior as R goes to infinity and as R goes to zero, right? And you should also be able to uh, uh, roughly guesstimate what the, uh, uh, the shape of the wave functions are going to look like as the energy levels uh, increase for this, uh, this problem. So what I challenge you to do is I challenge you to uh, take a piece of paper, um, sketch this... Uh, uh, interaction potential energy diagram on that piece of paper and fill in, let's say, three energy levels and then uh, sketch in uh, three wave functions that, that you think are appropriate for those three energy levels. And you should do this based on our prior discussions of, uh, of uh, uh, energy states in an infinitely high potential uh, well. And um, um, if you've understood that material, then you should, uh, should be able to come up with reasonable guesses in a qualitative sense for what these wave functions are going to look like. So um, I challenge you to turn the video off right now, to pause it, uh, and uh, go through this exercise because this is, this is one of the few times this semester 
uh, where you, you're going to have an opportunity to really test your understanding uh, against what, uh, what is, is actually known about, about these uh, stationary states and energy levels. So I'll give you a few minutes to work on that, and then we'll come back and discuss the problem. Okay, so uh, hopefully you took advantage of this uh, opportunity to try and sketch in the uh, energy eigenvalues and wave functions appropriate for this problem. Uh, this is strictly a qualitative exercise, so we're not terribly interested in the uh, absolute values. That'll come uh, when we work through the arithmetic. But I'd like to uh, just tell you briefly what what I think you should have uh, uh, thought about as you tried to work through this problem. So the first thing is uh, the interaction potential energy uh, is shown on the slide. There's going to be quantized energy states that are available inside that potential well for the electron to exist in. Um, let's say that the lowest energy state uh, that's allowed by Schrodinger's equation is represented by that, uh, that value right there. Uh, the, the wave function that's appropriate for that uh, energy state is going to have to satisfy boundary conditions. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to try and take advantage of the fact that the electrostatic potential energy is very negative, very, uh, very strongly attractive uh, as R goes to zero. So you would expect the wave function maybe to have a peak at R equal to zero. The second feature of the wave function is going to be that it decays exponentially as, uh, as R goes to infinity. So qualitatively, you might expect a wave function that has a peak and then decays exponentially as, as R goes, goes out towards infinity. That's the first, uh, that's the lowest energy eigenvalue allowed by Schrodinger's equation. There could be other energy eigenvalues. In fact, there are. There's an infinite number of them. Let's draw the second one. Qualitatively, um, it's going to lie at a higher energy. The uh, wave function is going to have to uh, uh, now pick up an additional oscillation because the number of oscillations in the wave function basically is telling you the, uh, the uh, energy of the electron state. And since the second state is at a higher energy, it's going to have more oscillations than the ground state. So again, the electron in the second state will have a, a peak in the wave function near r equal to zero. It'll pick up an oscillation. So qualitatively, uh, the wave function will come down, it will actually cross zero, and then exponentially go to zero as it enters into that potential energy uh, well. Um, the third state, uh, again, is going to be at somewhat higher energy. It's going to be up here, and the uh, electron wave function is going to have similar characteristics. It'll probably pick up another, uh, another oscillation in it, so if I had to sketch the wave function qualitatively, it would it would look something like this, okay, and um, so uh, in a very in a very simple way, this is the sort of exercise that you should have uh, uh, thought through, and, and uh, these are the types of, these are the shapes of the wave functions that you might guess just before you doing any of the arithmetic uh, involved in this problem, so. If you were able to think through this in a, in a reasonable way, then I think you've understood some of the fundamental ideas that we, uh, we discussed when we uh, set up that infinitely high potential well uh, uh, about a week back in, in the course. Okay? So, um, if we want to uh, think about this problem uh, analytically, um, uh, the, the, the effort is a little bit more involved than these qual qualitative sketches that we just did, right? So the strategy in solving Schrodinger's equation is that we're going to uh, say that the solutions uh, ca for capital Psi uh, are going to be comprised of three wave functions, and the, and the solutions are actually going to be the product of these three wave functions. One of the wave functions is going to is going to depend solely on the uh, radial parameter uh, small r, and we'll call that capital R. That's the wave function for the radial uh, part of Schrodinger's equation. There's going to be another function that satisfies the uh, theta part of the wave function, and we'll call that capital theta. And then there'll be a third uh, wave function, capital phi, which satisfies the phi uh, part of the wave function. 
Uh, and we're going to look for solutions that, that, that contain the product of capital R times capital theta times capital phi. Now, why would we want to propose a wave function that looks like this? Well, it has all kinds of mathematical advantages. And I like to just um, try to sketch that out to you very, very quickly here, right? If you, if you take the derivative with respect to R of this, this, this uh, composite wave function, because it's comprised of three separate parts, right? The parts that depend on theta and phi, the coordinates theta and phi, those are not acted on by the derivative with respect to the radial position R. So they slide right through the derivative, and you're left with the partial derivative of capital R with respect to the coordinate variable uh, small r. Well, since capital R only depends on the radial position, right? This partial derivative can then be readily turned into a total derivative without any loss of generality, and so that's what we've done here, right? Same thing happens if you take the derivative with respect to theta, right? Um, uh, you take the derivative with respect to the coordinate theta of the wave function psi, the radial part, capital R, and the uh, azimuthal uh, angle, capital, or the rotational angle phi, capital phi, um, uh, uh, they slide right through the derivative because there's no dependence of, of capital R or capital phi on theta, and you're just left with the derivative of the wave function capital theta with respect to the coordinate uh, theta, right? So this, this is a, a, a great simplification, and it allows you to uh, take Schrodinger's equation that we worked, uh, wrote down at the end of last lecture, it allows you to rewrite it in terms of um, a simpler form, right? And uh, this, this simpler form uh, then can be manipulated in a number of, uh, by, by executing a number of straightforward algebraic steps. And what we're going to show is at the end of the day, this, this composite wave fun this composite equation can be split into three separate equations. And the solutions of each of those three equations can then be uh, uh, analyzed separately. So the key point, of course, is this is still an eigenvalue uh, problem. The, uh, the uh, eigenvalue is the energy E. And it's, it's a very complicated eigenvalue problem because it's got a very complicated uh, operator on the left. Uh, the wave function comes back again on the right. And it's multiplied by the energy eigenvalue E. So um, the next couple slides, I just go through the uh, manipulations that are involved to get this uh, rather formidable looking equation into, uh, uh, into a form that, that we can analyze analytically. Um, it's not so much uh, worth my time to, to, to go through all these individual steps with you in the video. If you're really interested, you can, you can read because I basically tell you what I do at each step and I, I, I uh, um, uh, try to explain how I get from one line to the next. Uh, it's pretty straightforward algebra. Um, I, I continue on uh, and until I get to an equation that looks like this, right? I get an equation that looks like this through a number of very straightforward algebraic steps. And what I notice from this equation is something very interesting. I notice that all the terms on the left are independent of the coordinate phi. And the term on the right of this equation is the only term that, that is related to the coordinate phi. So the argument is the only way an equation like this can be true is if the term on the right is equal to a constant. It would be very unlikely, uh, in fact, it would be incredible if all these very complicated operations that are independent of the wave function uh, capital phi, independent of the coordinate small phi, if all those are equal to this, this uh, 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 term, which depends on the coordinate phi. The only way that's possible is if this term here happens to be equal to a constant, right? If that term happens to be equal to a constant, then it is possible that this complicated equation uh, for all theta and all, and all positions are, right, that could equal, equal a constant value. And so that's what we do. We set 
We set the right-hand side of this equation equal to a separation constant, and for convenience, we label it as m squared. So m is going to be, the small m is going to be one of the quantum numbers of the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen atom problem. We pick m squared strictly for convenience, and that'll become clear as we, uh, as we continue through with this discussion. What you can then do, okay, once you make that, re once that realization is made, you can then set the left-hand side of this equation equal to that constant m squared, right? That's just a number uh, to be determined, right? Uh, you can then rearrange this equation, and uh, what you find is you find at the end of the day that you have um, an equation that the a differential equation that's a function only of the radial position r equal to a uh, another differential equation which is a function only of the uh, angle theta, right? And again, that's a very strange equation, right? It basically is saying that um, for all r and all theta, right, these two, these two differential equations are equal to one another. And um, the only way that can be, right, the only way that can be is if each of these uh, equations separately are equal to another constant, okay? And that other constant is going to give rise to the second set of quantum numbers for the uh, allowed energy states of the hydrogen atom. So, um, uh, we're going to set that second constant, uh, uh, it's another, what's called a separation constant. We're going to set that equal to script L times script L plus one, where L is going to be a quantum number of the, uh, the hydrogen, of the electron state in the hydrogen atom, right? So there's two separation constants as we've introduced. The form of these uh, separation constants are dictated by the solutions of the differential equation, and we'll try to make, uh, we'll try to explain that later on, right? But uh, the first separation constant involved just the uh, wave function capital Phi. The separate second separation constant L times L plus one is uh, is appropriate for both capital theta, the wave function capital theta, and the wave function capital R. Right. So that's what I've I've set down right here, okay? So what we've managed to do is we've managed to take Schrodinger's very complicated differential equation, we've managed to break it now into three separate equations, one for capital Phi, one for capital Theta, and, and the third for capital R, right? Um, and what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to solve those three separate differential equations. and. Um, what I do here is I just, I just summarize those three separate equations that we're going to uh, be focused on, um, and we're going to try to, to calculate what the, uh, the solutions of those equations are. And in the process, in the process, we're going to find that, that uh, these uh, quantum numbers that, that were introduced, small m, script L, and then uh, the third, third quantum number is basically going to determine the energy E of the electron state, right? Those are going to come out as we, um, as we uh, work through the solutions. So when you come back for the next lecture, we're going to focus on the eigenfunctions, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to write down solutions for these uh, three differential equations. So we'll see you in, uh, when you're ready to, to listen to that lecture.